I'm really pleased that Dr. Hansen, James Hansen, has uh, had agreed to come and speak with, to us today. He, and you know, we all, a lot of us know this fellow. We we've watched him over the last 30 years, and he he was the first one talking about carbon dioxide in the air causing atmospheric warming, and. He was so compelling and so convincing early on that I, I, I agreed immediately with what was going on. And, and now he's, still, he's so persistent, he's still trying to promote an idea that we need to cut our carbon consumption, otherwise we're faced for catastrophe. Dr. James Hansen is formerly a director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And he's an adjunct professor at Columbia's University's Earth Science. And he directs a program in client science awareness and solutions. And he's also an advisor to our own group here, the Citizens Climate Lobby. So we're anxious, to, so we'll let Dr. Hansen begin. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks very much for, uh, for inviting me for this discussion. And we realized this is going to be a real low-tech presentation. Uh, we don't have projection capabilities there. So I printed out some charts, and we'll try this uh, and see if you can see them. Uh, so this was my title chart. And I'm not sure it's a very appropriate title for peace stock, but uh, I, I have the war on climate. Uh, taking ownership of our future. And um, in this war, I think we have met the enemy, as Pogo said, and uh, he is us. Now, that, uh, you know, the situation we are in is one which was a result of all good intentions. You know, we we need energy. Uh, I'll see if you can make this chart visible. I guess I got to go back like this. You know, uh, we, uh, we found out uh, a few centuries ago that uh, fossil fuels were tremendously useful and were able to uh, dispense with slavery, replace human energy with uh, fossil fuel energy. So that was very useful, and it, it, uh, it managed to bring about half the people in the world out of poverty. Uh, right now, in China, they're in the process of lifting a billion people out of poverty with the help of fossil fuels. And we can hardly tell them not to do that, uh, since we, that's what we did. Uh, so we need, but that has an impact on climate, and it has an impact on human health. Uh, and so we need to uh, figure out how to have clean, safe, abundant, affordable energy if we're going to solve uh, the problems uh, of global poverty and global climate. Uh, I don't know, you know, I usually uh, show these charts for temperature anomalies. Uh, of, this is the last, the four different maps are for January, February, and March of this year, and then the annual means for last year. Uh, the reason I show this is because people who live in the eastern half of the United States or Canada experienced an extremely cold uh, winter. Uh, I guess Minnesota is about on the borderline. Uh, February, it was pretty cold all the way back through the Midwest. But uh, the, the global average, the temperature last year was actually the warmest year averaged over the world in the last, uh, in the period of instrumental data. And this year is going to be even warmer uh, as we have a, a fairly strong El Nino in the tropical Pacific. And that's a natural fluctuation, but it tends to add to the warming trend. Uh, 
I think I won't try to show this for the last three months, but but what's been happening is the North Atlantic is actually quite cool. And uh, the reason for that, I believe, is related to the increasing melt from Greenland. And actually, we have a paper that's been accepted for publication. It will be coming out not this coming week, but the following week. Um, and it, uh, we, we show what the impacts are of the increasing meltwater from Greenland and from Antarctica. But uh, we know, you know, if you, in the media, you get the impression that there's a debate about climate change, in fact, it, and about global warming. But in fact, we know that the planet is getting warmer and it's going to continue to get warmer. And the reason is the carbon dioxide that we're adding to the atmosphere, which acts like a blanket. It absorbs heat radiation, so it causes a energy imbalance. It reduces the heat radiation to space, so we have more energy coming in from the sun than being radiated to space as heat. And we can now measure that planetary energy imbalance because most of that excess energy has to go into the ocean. The atmosphere is very thin. It has a very small heat capacity. And the continents have a low thermal conductivity so that the temperature anomalies penetrate only the upper few tens of meters. There's not much heat capacity in that much ground. But the ocean is four kilometers deep and it mixes. So in order to come to a new equilibrium temperature, you've got to warm up the whole ocean. And we can now measure how the ocean's temperature is changing because there have been uh, uh, more than 3,000 of these so-called Argo floats distributed around the world's ocean. They dive down into the ocean to a depth of two kilometers, making measurements of the temperature, salinity, and the velocity of the currents. Then they come back to the surface and radio their information to a satellite. And what we find is that, as we expected, the heat content of the ocean is continuing to increase uh, every year uh, because the planet is out of energy balance. There's more energy coming in than going out. And as a result, the planet is getting warmer over the last hundred years. And as I mentioned, uh, this last year was the warmest year in the record, and, next, and this, this year is going to be even warmer. So here's the situation. Uh, people do not recognize, but... The, the reality is that we have an emergency. We have a, a crisis uh, because the climate system does not respond quickly as we change the boundary conditions, as we change the composition of the atmosphere. And the result is that we have only felt about half of the global warming due to the gases that we've already added to the atmosphere, and we keep adding more. So the world has warmed up about eight or nine tenths of a degree Celsius, which is about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit. But there's almost that much more that's in the pipeline, and it's going to occur over coming decades. Uh, so what we're going to have to do is uh, reduce uh, fossil fuel emissions, or we will leave our children with a situation that's out of their control. And the reason this is a, a, a rather tragic situation is that the solution actually makes sense. It makes economic sense. But it's not being pursued. And in fact, it's not being proposed by either political party in the United States. Uh, let me let me say a few things uh, about the impacts that uh, we can expect to feel, and our children, in, especially, are going to feel. Uh, 
I, I, I tend to focus on the things that are irreversible, and that includes the extermination of species. Uh, and it includes the effect of ice sheet disintegration and sea level rise, because it takes thousands of years for an ice sheet to be built up by snowfall piling up. So if we cause them to disintegrate, the, the impact will be uh, permanent as far as humans are concerned. And then there are also uh, local climate anomalies that people notice, but, um, uh, and, and they're also important. But uh, so to start with this uh, question of extermination of species, um, we're putting stresses on different species in a number of different ways. Over harvesting, we, we overfish uh, some of the species. We're just taking over the land and we uh, over fertilize and introduce exotic species which uh, will take over for the native ones in combination with uh, climate change and shifting of climate zones this can lead to the extermination of species uh, because we're changing species can adapt to changing climate Ch climate has always changed but we are changing the climate forcing the atmospheric composition more than 10 times faster than has ever occurred in the history of the Earth. And that is uh, something that species are not um, adapted to, and many of them will not be able to, uh, uh, to deal with that. Uh, my, my favorite species is uh, an insect, uh, the uh, monarch butterfly. This uh, happens to be a, a, you know, when I, when my wife and I were younger, we could see a dozen monarch butterflies at the same time on our property. Now, we usually don't see any. Uh, and sometimes we'd see one of them. And this particular butterfly, uh, we noticed, what hung around our yard. It was the only one for about a month. And I think the reason that she stayed there, well, she has a broken wing, so she couldn't fly very well. Uh, but she produced, see, I started uh, planting uh, milkweeds with my grandchildren because the stress, the principal stress that we're uh, applying to the monarch butterfly is the destruction of the milkweed, which is the only thing that the caterpillars can eat. And the farmers uh, use Roundup, which uh, kills weeds, including milkweeds. And so the number of monarchs has started declining. So we would plant uh, milkweeds on our property. And uh, this one summer, there was just this one uh, butterfly. And, we, and she managed to produce about 30 uh, caterpillars. Uh, this is one of the butterflies that came out, uh, a male butterfly. There, anyway, there were about, about 30 of them. But we wondered how many of them would make it to Mexico. Now, I, I, most of you probably know that uh, monarchs migrate. They hibernate in Mexico, in a small volcanic uh, mountainous area in central Mexico, where they hibernate on fir trees, just in a small area. And then in the spring, they fly north uh, and go all the way to Canada. Uh, and uh, they make that circuit uh, in, in a year. Uh, it actually takes three or four generations of them to make the, uh, the annual migration. But somehow the, it's built into their DNA and they're able to find their way back. The grandchildren are able to find their way back to that mountain in Mexico. Uh, but that year, uh, when that broken wing butterfly was in our yard, there was a tremendous, this was 2011, there was a tremendous drought in Texas and Oklahoma, and we wondered how many of the butterflies would make it through there and get to uh, Mexico. Well, I wrote an article about that butterfly, and a Mexican scientist uh, sent me uh, an email and some photographs 
this is a branch of one of the fir trees on that um, volcanic mountain in Mexico where there are you know, thousands of these monarch butterflies. Uh, and uh, this, was, uh, this was his son, the, the grandson actually, of that uh, Mexican scientist looking up at the monarch butterflies. And what he saw was that uh, it, the monarchs flying around the trees, but you see the fir trees are not doing very well. They're, uh, because of the uh, droughts that they've been having in central Mexico, which are associated with this shifting of climate zones. So that scientist is actually trying to get the Mexican government to plant some of these fir trees in a higher up the mountain where it's a more appropriate climate. But in any case, the number of monarchs that made it to Mexico that year was a reduction of 30% from the year before. And in the subsequent, the next year, there was even a stronger drought in the Midwest United States. You may remember 2012. Uh, and the number uh, declined uh, by 50% further and uh, it became, so this, this is a bar graph showing how many there are uh, butterflies making it to Mexico. And, uh, they, and by 2014, number was uh, only about 5% of what it was 30 years ago. But then, so I thought they may be committed to extinction because monarchs don't fly in pairs the way birds do. They travel more independently, so it's harder for a male and female to hook up if the number becomes too small. But in fact, this last winter, there was an increase in the number uh, getting to Mexico, although I have not seen a single monarch uh, this year. But my sis, one of my sisters lives in Minnesota, in St. Paul, and she's seen a number of them this year. So it, it may be that those that go up the uh, East Coast are... Uh, it, have different DNA than those that go through the Midwest because there, there seem to be more of them in the Midwest than uh, along the East Coast. Anyway, that's one one uh, species out of millions. Uh, there are actually about a million species associated with coral reefs. Uh, and coral reefs are threatened by both the warming ocean, which causes the coral, if they get too hot, they expel their symbiotic algae and die. Uh, but also, the ocean is becoming more acid. As carbon dioxide in the air increases, it makes the ocean more acid. And those animals that have a carbonate skeleton or exoskeleton are threatened if the ocean becomes too acid. It can dissolve the carbonates. Uh, and there are about a million species that are associated with coral reefs. So it's fairly, it's important uh, that we maintain the health of coral reefs. Uh, but we are losing about 1% uh, per year of, of coral reefs. Uh, so that, so species, and, and uh, what IPCC has concluded is that if, we stay on business as usual, we will lose between 25 and 50 percent of the species on the planet. So it's a good reason not to stay on business as usual. But now let's talk about ice sheet disintegration and sea level. The, the problem there is that as the ocean gets warmer, it melts the ice shelves, the tongues of ice that come out from Greenland and Antarctica into the ocean. If the ocean warms and melts those ice shelves, then the ice sheets, those ice shelves buttress the main ice sheet. And if you lose the ice shelf, then the ice sheet can discharge ice to the ocean more rapidly. And what we see, for example, on, on Greenland is that the area, the red area where you have melting in the summer has been increasing. It fluctuates from year to year with the weather. But in general, it's increasing, and that's causing an increase in the water that uh, melts on the surface of the ice sheet. It burrows a hole in the ice sheet, goes to the base of the ice sheet, and lubricates it, and, and speeds up the motion 
of the ice sheet and the discharge of uh, giant icebergs uh, to the ocean. And uh, we can now measure, using the gravity satellite, we can measure the mass of the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet. And what we see is that they are losing mass at an increasing rate. And uh, sea level is beginning to go up faster. Uh, if you go back 100 years, it was going up half a millimeter a year. It's now going up more than three millimeters a year, which is about 14 inches in a century. It's uh, more than a nuisance, but it's not yet disastrous. But the problem is uh, that the disintegration of ice sheets is a very nonlinear process. And in the paper that we're about to publish, we point out uh, some processes which are going to make the ice sheet disintegration a very nonlinear process if we uh, allow the ocean to continue to get warmer. You, probably, you may not be able to see this, but the way the ocean circulation works is um, in the North Atlantic Ocean in the winter, the water will get very cold and it's salty. Part of the water has come from the Mediterranean. It's very salty. If it gets cold and salty, it's very heavy and it sinks and drives this overturning um, meridional circulation all the way from the north, from the Greenland to Antarctica. And as that water comes up around Antarctica, it again, it gets further cooled and, uh, and sinks all the way to the bottom of the ocean. That's called Antarctic bottom water. And it goes throughout the lower half of the global ocean. But now what's happening is that we're getting more rapid melt from the Antarctic ice sheet. And that's putting fresh water on the surface of the Southern Ocean. That's a problem because it makes the ocean column stable. Instead of sinking, there's a reduction in this sinking water just because the, the, it's a more stable column. And uh, normally, as this ocean water comes to the surface, it expels heat to the atmosphere because it's very cold around Antarctica. In the winter, it's like minus 30 degrees Celsius. So it'll expel heat to the ocean and to space. Now, in, instead, that heat is staying in the ocean. It's melting the foot of the ice shelves. And those ice shelves are now melting faster and faster. And as those disappear, then Antarctica sheds ice to the ocean more rapidly. And what we conclude, and, and we can measure that, uh, yeah, I, you may have a hard time seeing this, but the amount of mass that the Antarctic, this is Greenland ice sheet, and this is the Antarctic ice sheet, it fluctuates from year to year, but it's losing mass more and more rapidly. We know from the Earth's history that the last time the planet was two degrees Celsius warmer than a pre-industrial, which means one degree Celsius warmer than now, sea level was uh, six to eight meters higher than it is now. So we really don't want to see the planet get two degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial. We would be guaranteeing that some future generations would lose all of the coastal cities in the world. And more than half of the major cities in the world are on coastlines. The, the uh, point of our paper is to argue that contrary to uh, the impression that you may get from glaciologists that it will take many centuries for, to get multimeter sea level rise, what we argue is that it's, it's likely to occur this century. If you look at the rate at which the mass is being lost from these ice sheets, it's increasing with a doubling time close to 10 years, which if it continues to accelerate at that rate, it would mean that within 
about four to five decades, we would be having sea level rise of multimeters, which would cause us to lose our coastal cities. So anyway, that's an issue that will be raised in our upcoming paper. And, uh, well, it would be hard to see on these maps, but you, you, you probably know Florida would be underwater, uh, Bangladesh would be underwater, the lowlands in Europe would be underwater. We really uh, can't allow that to happen. But it's going to happen unless we begin to phase down rapidly our fossil fuel emissions. Uh, this cartoon says <laughs> this is about uh, people saying, well, we're ready to start building the ark, Noah. <laughs> before Noah is uh, is drowned in the water, and uh, anyway, that's uh, that's I think the major issue with continued fossil fuel emissions, and we just don't have governments that have uh, decided to recognize the reality of what the science is telling us. Uh, so let me just say a few things about the climate extremes. Um, it, as the planet gets warmer, you get more extreme heat waves and droughts and therefore uh, more extreme fires. Uh, at the same time, a warmer planet, a warmer atmosphere holds more water vapor. So therefore, at those times and places where you have low pressure systems and you get rainfall, you get heavier rains and greater, uh, greater floods because the amount of water that the atmosphere can hold is a very strong nonlinear function of temperature. As the atmosphere gets warmer, it holds more water vapor and when we do get rain, it comes in heavier events and storms that are driven by latent heat that means the energy and water vapor are going to be stronger if there's more water vapor. So that means thunderstorms, tornadoes, tropical storms, all of which get their fuel from water vapor are going to have the potential to be stronger as the planet gets warmer. And we, and we see an increase in, in the fires. Uh, uh, there, there are some other reasons the way we've been treating our forests also contribute to this, but there's a, there's a definite increase in the intensity of these uh, fires. And there's also an increase in the intensity of the flooding. The 100-year flood now occurs more often than once a century. And as I mentioned, the storm strength uh, does increase. This is a photo of uh, the Hurricane sand that, Sandy. And that, you know, it, each storm is different. But this one was able to stay a hurricane all the way up to New York City because the Atlantic Ocean was about three degrees warmer than, uh, than it has been on average over the last century. And that did cause a lot of damage at different places uh, in, in New Jersey, in New York, uh, on, on the shores, on the east, eastern coast, uh, even uh, especially on uh, Coney Island, uh, Long Island, uh, New York. Well, the bottom line is that it, the science has become clear. We cannot burn all these fossil fuels. This, this, this bar graph shows the oil, gas, and coal. The dark purple is the fuel that we've burned so far. It's only a fraction of the total that's in the ground. But we've already burned most of what we can afford to burn if we want to keep the climate within uh, the bounds that would uh, allow us to hand our children uh, a stable situation. So we can't, we have to leave most of the remaining fossil fuels in the ground. It's, it's, uh, they're, they're re it's possible to stabilize climate, but it would require phasing out coal uh, rapidly and not going after the unconventional fossil fuels like tar sands. We shouldn't even be pursuing the last drops of oil in the Arctic uh, 
we have to move on to uh, clean energies. But as I said at the beginning, you know, energy is not is not a bad thing. We need energy if we're going to uh, if people are going to have a reasonable style uh, lifestyle and, and lift uh, the other half of the world out of poverty. And uh, unfortunately, most of our energy is from coal, oil, and gas. Uh, 85% of our energy is coming from fossil fuels. And the carbon dioxide emissions even or even about coal has more CO2 per unit energy than the other fossil fuels. So about 50% of the CO2 emissions are from coal. Uh, and uh, as I say, about 85% of the total. What we're going to have to do, the, the problem is actually solvable. But we're going to need carbon-free electricity. If we had carbon-free electricity, that's electricity is becoming a larger and larger fraction of our total energy use. And we can make liquid, no carbon liquid fuels from electricity if we have no carbon electricity. This uh, uh, may be hard for you to see, but... Uh, this is showing the amount of carbon uh, per unit energy uh, where different countries are trying to decarbonize their electricity. The one country that has come the closest is Sweden. Uh, well, this is the total, total carbon intensity of the uh, entire uh, economy. Uh, Sweden has completely decarbonized its electricity because it has hydropower and it has nuclear power. And it uses those two sources to get its electricity. It still has about 20% uh, carbon intensity because uh, the vehicles are using uh, uh, fossil fuels. But as I said, if you have carbon-free electricity, you can make liquid fuels uh, from that energy, uh, no carbon, with no net carbon. The other country that's come fairly close to Sweden is France, uh, because they have mostly carbon-free electricity, and that's primarily because of uh, nuclear power. But, but. Uh, that's that's one of the uh, one of the issues which I think uh, you, the public, need to think about. Uh, I, I don't see any way that China and India, you know, our emissions are flattening out. Still, there most of our energy is from coal, oil, and gas. But at least the amount that we're using is flattening out, uh, while Places like China and India, it's still going up very rapidly. And it's going up because they're using a lot of coal to uh, try to uh, raise the standard of living of the people in those countries. And I just don't see any way that they're going to be able to phase out their carbon emissions, which is what's going to be necessary uh, without the help of nuclear power. So I think we should, if we don't want to have nuclear power, we should at least be helping uh, China and India because uh, they are going to, they are working on nuclear power and Russia is more than happy to uh, sell them nuclear power. But what's happened in the U.S. is first Jimmy Carter and then Bill Clinton decided that uh, we would just uh, phase out uh, nuclear power. If we'd stop doing research and development. Uh, so we're still stuck with 50-year-old uh, technology in our nuclear power plants. While there's a, a potential for much improved technology, including fourth-generation 
uh, technology which can burn nuclear waste and use that as a fuel and can burn excess weapons material and use that as a fuel. I think it's a mistake not to do the research and development to uh, make nuclear power as safe as possible and, um, and help China and India get off of coal. But that's uh, the, the fundamental problem is that fossil fuels right now are the cheapest energy. They appear to be the cheapest energy to the public. And that's because they are partly subsidized, but also because they're not made to pay their cost to society. So the human health effects of air pollution and water pollution from uh, fossil fuels, and there are... Three and a half million people per year who die of air pollution, and about three and a half million that die from indoor air pollution. Uh, so the costs of that are actually enormous. In the United States, it's only about 50,000 people a year, but the asthma, there's a lot of uh, human health costs associated with the pollution. And you're not you can't ask the fossil fuel companies to pay for your child's asthma. You know, you're stuck with that bill yourself. What we should do is make fossil fuels pay their cost to society by collecting a fee from the fossil fuel companies at the source, the domestic mine or the port of entry. And we should distribute that money to the public. Uh, that way, the person who does better than average in limiting their carbon footprint would make money. Uh, and, uh, and we could, that's what, I, that's what we call the so-called uh, fee and dividend. Uh, the merits of this are that it's a very simple, transparent way to make fossil fuels pay their cost to society. And... It it would uh, it's market based because it's you government would not get any money you distribute a hundred percent of the money to the public and it will stimulate the economy it will stimulate innovation because people will want to discover low carbon and no carbon uh, products uh, and uh, and it, economic study has shown that if you put on this gradually rising, uh, you don't want to do it suddenly because you want to people to have time to adjust and make different choices as they buy things in the future. But uh, it, it, an economic study has shown that if you have a carbon fee of $10 a ton, it goes up $10 a ton. Uh, each year, after 10 years, it'll reduce U.S. emissions 30%, which is much greater than any other thing that's been talked about. Uh, and this fee and dividend puts money in the hands of the public, and it's uh, it's the only approach that would work internationally, because if the United States and China would agree to have a carbon fee, they would also then put a border duty on products from countries that don't have an equivalent carbon fee, and that would be a tremendous incentive for other countries to have their own uh, carbon fee so that they could collect the money themselves rather than have us collect it at the border. Uh, as opposed to what's talked about you know, at the Kyoto Protocol and what's being talked about for Paris, you can't just ask each country to reduce its emissions and you hope that it will do it. You've, you've got to have a, a mechanism for that to happen. Uh, and that, that has got to be one that causes the phase out of fossil fuels. So there's, there's one uh, organization that uh, does understand this and has been begun to advocate uh, this kind of policy in Washington and even now in some other countries, in Canada and other countries, there are chapters of the Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, and uh, I, I particularly like this organization because it's using the democratic process uh, 
um, in a way which will be effective if we get enough people behind it. And Citizens Climate Lobby has almost doubled in size each year for the last few years. Um, in in uh, addition to visiting their legislatures and, and trying to acquaint uh, the legislatures with uh, this concept of uh, a carbon fee, they also write letters to the editor and, uh, and op-eds and uh, are, are beginning to be um, uh, to be heard, I think, and I think they're the best hope uh, for getting the kind of actions that we need if we're going to phase down uh, fossil fuel use at the rate that is needed if we're going to be fair to our children and grandchildren. And so I encourage people to visit uh, the website of citizensclimatelobby.org. Uh, that, um, if, if you have time uh, to contribute to uh, the future of young people, I, I encourage you to consider joining that organization. Because once they get big enough, uh, their message is so uh, sensible that I think uh, it can eventually be heard. Uh, I think I'll stop there and we can perhaps have a discussion. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. We will take questions from the floor now. Sorry. I'm going to talk to the crowd. I think you'll be able to hear me. That's all right. Okay. All right. I'm a former military analyst. I used to teach the game theory that military analysts use to understand how wars develop and proceed. I'm going to use the microphone. Okay. I'm, I'm, I, I'm a former military analyst. I used to teach the game theory that the military uses to analyze things. I'm very familiar with the kinds of studies like you've probably heard of like the National Intelligence Estimates, the NIEs. And I'm going to tell you right now that when I went to Washington with the CCL group, that was part of our story was that the military understands that global warming is the problem of the century, of the millennium. They are already making plans for how to deal with t tens and twenties of millions of refugees trying to move out of lands that aren't going to be usable, either because they can't grow crops anymore because they're too dry or too hot or too far under the ocean. So <clears throat> that was one of our powerful selling points and it's why it's important for you to hear these stories because you're here for peace, but you're gonna have a hard time fighting for peace if you have a planet full of refugees. So what this man said uh, is just right on the point. It is a crisis beyond crisis and that's why I'm here and I'm gonna come out of the closet and tell you I'm one of the Republicans that, that went to that conference, and, and I was well received there, and I appreciate a, a reception here, so thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Well, thanks very much. I, didn't, I don't think I heard the question, though. <laughs> Just giving background. Go ahead, speak into the microphone. Well... I get the impression there's a very large anti-nuclear movement in the United States, and, and they act like nuclear power, nuclear energy is evil and incredibly hazardous, and yet when I look into that, I mean uh, that the record doesn't support that. So I just wanted your, what would you say to that? Yeah, it's, um, uh, it's an emotional uh, issue for many people rather than an objective scientific analysis. You know, if you look at our existing technology, which was developed 40 or 50 years ago, in the United States, uh, the most serious accident that we had was Three Mile Island. 
which did release uh, radiation, uh, exposed residents of Pennsylvania to radiation. If you make the assumption, the most extreme assumption, that the so-called linear no threshold assumption, that even the smallest amounts of radiation are harmful, uh, then you would calculate that as many as one or two Pennsylvania residents may get cancer and die from the radiation exposure out of a population in which 40,000 people will die from other cancers. Uh, we get exposed to that much radiation in two airplane flights across, across the United States. Uh, but at the same time, the emissions from fossil fuel burning are killing uh, three and a half million people a year, which is 10,000 people a day. Uh, if you look at the particles that are coming off of this uh, fossil fuel burning, it's organic carbon, black soot. If you look at those in a microscope, they're very ugly looking particles. <laughs> to a physicist, they're a lot more ugly than the alpha particles and the radiation particles that are coming off of uh, the nuclear radiation. But somehow, the the air pollution, it just doesn't frighten people, even though it's killing 10,000 people a day. What if there was a nuclear accident that killed 10,000 people? We would close every nuclear power plant. It's, uh, it's just an, an irrational situation. And that's with technology that, that uh, was 50 years old. Now, you should, we should, it's like airplanes. You d if you have, there were, have been accidents with nuclear power. The one in, in Japan was avoidable, and you wouldn't, with the newer technologies, it wouldn't happen. Uh, but uh, it's, it's like with airplanes. If you have an accident, you don't say, okay, we're not going to make any more airplanes. You say, let's figure out how to make the airplanes safer. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I, think, uh, I think we're making a big mistake, uh, and, and it's unfortunate for our children. We should have said a few decades ago, let's work on this technology and make it better. Uh, we can still do that, and I think uh, that, that we had better do that, because I don't see any way that China and India can phase out coal use if without the help of, of uh, nuclear power. In fact, I'm, I'm working with Chinese scientists. We're going to have a workshop uh, later this year uh, on this topic. Um, I and I, I think it, I think it's, it would make sense to try to get people in the United States to look more objectively at this. But it's really uh, it's a it's tough, you know. When I say something positive about nuclear power, then I get inundated by the the environmental groups which have. The leadership has taken a position that nuclear should be phased out, and they simply won't listen to any uh, arguments to the contrary. And they have people ready to debate you. It's just like the uh, deniers in the climate change scheme. It hardly pays to try to argue on television with them because they, they have they've got a script and they're pretty good. At, uh, at, their, uh, uh, at their job, which is to try to, uh, uh, to argue against nuclear power. So uh, anyway, I, it's, that, that's kind of the situation we're faced with. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, what percentage of fossil fuel burning in the United States is caused by our military adventures and spending trillions of dollars on military uh, 
overseas and and all just the trillions of dollars that we spend on the military means quite a bit of fossil fuel uh, emission and what percentage of that is the total uh, for like say the united states yeah well i don't have the exact number for that it is a significant number and historically the military has not paid any attention to energy efficiency. Now they have begun to uh, uh, to do that, uh, but they're still using a lot of fossil fuels. And it's uh, you know if you step back and analyze the problem, you, we in to a substantial degree, you know, we've been protecting using the military to protect supply lines for global fossil fuels, global oil. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't really make sense on the long run now that we understand the climate story and the fact that we can't afford to burn all of that. So instead, we should be using our resources to find ways to develop low carbon, no carbon energy and energy efficiency and, um, and I think it should also include uh, advanced uh, generation nuclear power. But regardless of that, you really don't need to take a position on nuclear power. What we do need to do is put a price on carbon and then let the alternatives compete. If the people who argue that the sun and the wind can provide all of our energy, if they're right, then uh, that, that will successfully compete. But we have to put that price on carbon in order for that competition to occur. <laughs> this is Don Irish. My comments will be a bit sensitive, but I think they need to be said. I have seen nothing in the two major parties that are going to make such movement against corporations and so forth effective. Uh, I wish there was a case different, but neither one that I notice are working it that way. There is the Green Party. There's also the party of the man who's, we had a 250 acre farm in New Hampshire next to him in Vermont. I've known him for a long time. I've had dinner with him and so forth. We need to think politically as they come up. I'm not suggesting that you decide what I say, but I think we need to not, we should not assume that two major parties are other than empire now. They are not a democracy. We have foreign, we have our own troop, troops in 700 places. How many foreign troops are in our country? Zero. We are in a position of getting democracy in operation. And it's a little sensitive to do this. I'm not trying to, to um, change it. But we need a government that will act on these things and do what it, these gentlemen and the thing has made possible. And I don't see it or hear it. And um, although I've studied this quite a bit as a u university professor and had a whole collection of materials on climate change and talked to groups about it, I'm not a scientific ex expert. I'm a social expert that hopes that we can be wise when it comes to making decisions politically. Thank you. I know this is a bit maybe inappropriate to be so political, but we cannot do it with what we have the way they are. Uh, I, you, could you, could I, I, frankly, I could not understand uh, what was said. Could you summarize in a sentence or two what the, the question was? He said that there's no political will in our two-party system to make radical changes, and he's saying we may need to look elsewhere. Oh, yeah, I, I would certainly like to uh, comment on that. <laughs> you know, I'm in the... I'm in the process of writing a book which is uh, tentatively titled uh, In Search of Truth. 
And uh, I do <clears throat> describe uh, my frustration with both political parties in the United States. Uh, and I am afraid, you know, they're too similar. Uh, they're both uh, uh, under the influence of money uh, and uh, the, the contributions that they get from uh, the business community. Uh, so I, yeah, and, but you know, we can still make this democracy work, but I am skeptical about whether we can get either the Democratic or Republican Party to uh, do what is necessary on this energy uh, story because of the uh, tremendous power of the, of the energy fossil fuel industry. So I actually look at an organization like Citizens Climate Lobby as potentially being the seed for a third political party. I like to say we should have an American party, which is based, which is based on the, uh, based on the principles that our, our government was founded on. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's more feasible than you might think. If you, I remember in 2008, when I was giving a talk at a, a few universities, including, uh, Virginia Tech, the students were very excited about uh, the Barack Obama candidacy, and it was because of this excitement, you know, the, the belief that this was going to be different, that different than the political parties that we had had, the, the governments we had had. And, and it was the young people and just the excitement of it was people sending in five and ten dollars that f financed uh, his campaign at the early stages when he overtook Hillary and and won the Iowa primary and then moved ahead and got the nomination. So it is possible, and it was partly because young people knew how to use the social media. Uh, it didn't require uh, hundreds of millions of dollars on uh, television advertisements. Uh, so it is, it, uh, uh, I, I think uh, we may have to go down that path. I mean, if you think that Ross Perot, who saw, Mech who saw Martians on his front yard, uh, the public uh, still was willing to give him 20% of the vote because they're fed up with the two uh, existing parties. Um, and now I think they're even more fed up now. So it's... It's possible that the rules are set up such that it's difficult for a third party to to get started. But uh, but that may be the way that uh, we have to go. Uh, it's it will take a, a little while, but it wouldn't take that long. It's possible with the way communication now happens that things could move quite rapidly. Thank you. So I think that's a possibility. My question is um, uh, technical. Um, what's the what's the liquid fuel that's not carbon based that you speak of that can be made from electricity? Yeah, well, one liquid fuel that they know how to do easily is hydrogen. I'm not particularly keen on that. I mean, you it's it, it you know I actually uh, I. Uh, one of Audi, I believe it was, one of the European automobile manufacturers, a representative recognized me on the airplane and asked me if I wanted to try out their hydrogen powered car. So they, they loaned me their car for two weeks. And it was really, really a, a nice uh, car. But the problem is you'll need a, a new distribution system for uh, hydrogen. It's amazing that they could... Um, package the fuel in the car such that it has to be very cold and yet they had the 
fuel tank so well insulated that you could leave it out in the summer for two weeks uh, and still have the car start two weeks later, uh, have it cold enough that it would still start. But, uh, but I, I'm a little skeptical about whether we want to go. There, it's also possible to make carbon-based fuels. Now, I'm not an expert. I can't really explain that to you. But you can, they, there are ways you can suck CO2 out of the atmosphere, make a carbon-based fuel, then you burn it, and it, CO2 goes back to the atmosphere again. So it's no net uh, CO2 to the atmosphere. It's, right now, it's expensive, it, but it's possible. And uh, it, if you started doing this in a large way, I think you could get the price down to be competitive, provided that you put this fee on carbon. Because if you don't, there's still there are big pools of oil in places like Saudi Arabia where you can get it out of the ground for, you know, five dollars a barrel. Uh, so. You're not going to be able to compete with that unless you put a, a fee on the carbon emission. And then the fuel that's no net carbon would, would eventually win out. Thank you. So, D Dr. Hansen, I have uh, followed your writings and I was arrested with you just once. And uh, so I have it's too many questions here, but I'll do a pair, and then I just want to throw in the last one. So when you say 30% reduction in 10 years, the question about that is, do you really think that if we, our reduction is that slow that we'll still be here in 10 years? And the second question that I'm just putting together with that is, uh, have you thought about giving up industrial civilization? <laughs> uh, well, you, you can think about it, but how are you going to impose that on China? <laughs> you see, the problem is there, there are now people who are say, okay, I'm willing to uh, go off-grid, I'm willing to live in a simple lifestyle, uh, but uh, there, are other, there are large parts of the world where people have aspirations. Uh, for uh, a better lifestyle, and, and they're, uh, they're working very hard. Uh, they're willing to work very hard to get that. And uh, we can hardly tell them, oh, you can't do this. We did it, but we're not going to let you do it. Um, I so I, I just think uh, we're going to have to find carbon-free energies. Uh, and... Uh, you know, if we got 30% in 10 years, yeah, we would, that's, that would slightly, that would overshoot other things being equal. If everybody did that, we would still be somewhat above 350 ppm in year 2100. But, you know, there are ways to get the soil and the forest to take up more CO2 if we would improve our agricultural and forestry practices. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting that the amount of CO2 we're pumping into the air by burning fossil fuels, only 55% is appearing in the air. The other 45% is being taken up partly by the ocean, but also partly by the, uh, the soil and the forests, because, partly because we're fertilizing. We're, we're fertilizing both by putting CO2 in the air and by spreading nitrogen all over the place. Uh, but uh, I think uh, if we could get reductions at that rate, 3% a year over decades, that we would be close enough to balancing the planet's uh, energy budget that we could figure out the additional uh, piece that we would need. You are an extreme uh, optimist, sir. It's what we won't be able to do is if we stay on this accelerating course for another decade or so, then then that 3% would have to become a, a much larger and it becomes impractical. Okay. Um, can I comment? So um, I'm aware that holistic management involving cattle is the way to restore soils 
to, to, to remove deserts and to get the water back into the ground and balance things. I'm aware that forests can be planted. I'm aware, I mean, I'm in permaculture and I'm actively engaged in that. And it drives me crazy that industrial agriculture continues to, to create deserts and do this stuff. And as far as I can tell, we need both to launch a full-scale transition to holistic management and we need to immediately stop doing fossil fuels. Um, and I don't think it's my business what China does. I think if the United States would take a baby step, we would see some action from the rest of the world. But we have been the leaders in how much more can we burn and how fast can we destroy the planet, which is not your responsibility, but. <laughs> well, you know, one of the merits of the rising carbon fee is that it will favor the nearby farm. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I do think, uh, you know, there are a number of disadvantages with the big factory farm. Uh, and the fact that we import food from New Zealand, we can do that because there's no tax on aviation fuel. It was agreed in the 1940s that we would have, we, we would, uh, we would help the budding airline industry by agreeing internationally to have no no uh, carbon taxes, no taxes on aviation fuel. Well, that's allowing us, that's crazy, because now we're burning fossil fuels to import food from halfway around the world. Yeah. So one of the merits of a, of a rising carbon fee would be to favor the, the nearby farm. Uh, uh, there was another point you made I was going to comment on, but I forgot now. Yeah, um, I, I just, you know, I, I just, you're more optimistic than I am. Um, well, and uh, yeah, the other thing was we, we can't ignore what China is doing because they've, you know, we were the major emitter. And if you look at the total excess CO2 in the atmosphere, we're responsible for twice as much, more than twice as much as China. But now their emissions have shot past ours. They're almost double Our ours. Purpose. So it, it does. De the future does depend mm -hmm. upon uh, these China and India finding uh, energy sources that do not produce that CO2. And I think we have an obligation to help them because we burned their share. We of did. the carbon budget. Our per person emissions are still way more than theirs. I want to recommend a book called The Enemy Within, which redoes the statistics on cancer and nuclear power. I encourage you to read it. It's available online. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hansen, first I'd like to thank you for your work and for your continued work. I know you've been talking about climate change well before anybody else was and your courage and your persistence and when you've been flipped the proverbial bird by various presidential administrations I admire you greatly um, I, my predecessor Shoto she's a friend of mine in a Unitarian group in Northfield Minnesota and I have to say that I am not terribly hopeful at this point and I would like to ask you when I see some of the literature, I see we're going to do X and Y by 2030, we're going to do X and Y by 2100, and that all just seems terribly, terribly, terribly way too late. We need to be doing something now, today. I don't see that happening. I don't see the political will for it. I don't see the public having the awareness of it. And I'm just wondering where you think in terms of a timeline, and I understand this may be nuanced, but where you are in a timeline for where we are really going to be, are we still in a position to avert anything but the absolutely, absolutely worst climate catastrophe on the planet? Thank you. Yeah, there, I mean, it's... I, I share your frustration with uh, the way the politics has worked, and I'm I am concerned that the Paris uh, agreements are likely to be uh, similar to the Kyoto, in the sense that they will set goals which have no way for you to enforce them. You're, we're, each country is being asked to have some ambitious goals to reduce the emissions 25% by year, such and such. Uh, 
I don't think that's going to be very effective. It was not effective in the case of the Kyoto Protocol. Emissions actually increased more rapidly after the protocol was adapt adopted than before. So I think that we have to have a, a an across-the-board carbon fee. And that's what has to be understood by the United States and China. And if it is understood by both, then we have a chance. Uh, I don't think the agreement necessarily has to come in Paris. It, because it's really hard to get an agreement when you've got 190 countries, each one of them arguing for some benefits. Uh, and uh, But I do see the fact, first of all, the Chinese leadership does not deny the reality of the climate change. And they have more than 300 million people living near sea level. They don't want to see uh, climate run out of control. And, and they can see climate impacts already in China. So I think that they are be willing to cooperate. Um, so I see hope of that happening. We just have to keep after our political leaders. Um, and we have to stress that we want an honest approach, which puts a price on carbon. And, and frankly, you know, I've gone to Washington and talked with some leading conservatives, including Grover Norquist, and the thoughtful conservatives actually uh, are not denying climate change. And they are ready to agree on a, a carbon fee if it's revenue neutral. They don't want the government to having a new tax, which makes the government bigger and makes social programs bigger. So they... they but I think the compromise needs to be that we'll have a revenue neutral rising carbon fee. So I, I see movement uh, among conservatives and among other countries. So I do think there, there's a possibility that in the next several years we will get real motion. Uh, I'm not so optimistic about Paris because they're still talking like we're in Kyoto. Dr. Hansen, first, I want to say thank you very much for all you're trying to do. We only have one planet, and uh, I think your presentation in regard to this heat that's coming, heat that's captured, not being sent off from the sun or bounced back out is, is very crucial. Um, uh, I want to mention two ideas that, that came across to my mind after I stood up here, and then I want to ask a question. Um, one I just saw today. Uh, Common Dreams has an article about uh, some papers that reveal that the oil industry was well aware of, of the climate change problems that were occurring long before it was even brought out in the scientific community. And uh, so I refer everybody to check that out if they have a chance. And then uh, uh, other thing, uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go straight to my question. Uh, um, <clears throat> Your, your acceptance of the nuclear energy is kind of disheartening to me because my understanding is that uh, one of the main uh, waste products of a nuclear power is depleted uranium, and there are a number of steps in the decay of uranium, one of which is a four and a half billion year half-life. And the Earth has been around for four and a half billion years or so. And so that means that in four and a half billion years, another span of the time the Earth has been here, we will have had one half of the amount uh, as present decay. Of course, during its decay process, it's sending out radiation which can hurt living materials. And the remaining half will dissipate by 50% in the next four and a half billion years. So I think it's really arrogant for us to think that we can store uh, uh, a toxic radiation in a sensible manner when our lifespan is about 100 years. So I just, I don't understand how you can, how you can uh, accept that. And oh, I, here's the last thing I want to say is that I think there's two main problems that we have for our species. One is for different 
cultures, different peoples to learn to live with each other peacefully. And the second is for humankind as a whole to live with other species with enough respect to allow sustainable ecological continuation. And if we could get those two things under control, which of course means balanced energy and peace, then maybe we have a chance. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> yeah, I certainly agree with uh, those goals. But let me, uh, let me uh, mention uh, the situation with regard to uh, nuclear waste. The half-life, uh, first of all, the existing technology, this uh, second generation nuclear technology that we now have in our nuclear plants is burning only six tenths of one percent of the energy in the nuclear fuel. The remaining 99 percent is left in a waste pile, which has a half-life that's measured in 10,000 years. It's, it's a few tens of thousands of years. It's not a billion years, but it's, it's a very long time. But there's no need uh, to use that technology. What we need to mo do is move to the fourth generation nuclear technology, which allows the neutrons to move fast enough that it burns more than 99% of the nuclear fuel. And the waste product that remains has a half-life that's measured in decades. So the volume of the nuclear waste is significantly smaller, and its half-life is much smaller. So that within two to 300 years, the material is no longer significantly radioactive. It becomes a very manageable uh, waste uh, problem uh, if you develop this, uh, this technology. That was the technology which Bill Clinton uh, decided they would not uh, develop uh, because of the pressure from the anti-nuclear people who had helped elect him. Uh, that's a big mistake because Russia has gone right ahead with that technology. China and South Korea uh, have uh, budding fourth generation technology. We would be much better off if we were, we have always had the top uh, nuclear engineers in the world and we have the best universities in the world. We have the potential to be the world leaders and make sure that the technologies are as good and as safe as possible. And uh, it is, a, in my opinion, it's a big mistake not to uh, complete that development because it largely solves the problem that you mentioned, the waste problem. The nuclear waste can be used as a fuel in the fourth generation nuclear reactors. And that's how we will dispose of not only the waste, but the excess weapons material that we have. We created in the in the race with the Soviet Union, we created an enormous amount of uh, nuclear material, which can power our economy for more than a century, uh, just by using that uh, excess weapons material. We just have to use the more advanced technologies that can handle, that can solve this waste problem. Hi, uh, just in a, before I get to my question, I would like to respond to this uh, line of thought and ask you and ask you isn't it, it, are there any fourth generation nuclear power plants online and proven to be safe and proven to be as effective as the sci as the scientists that you uh, hang around with uh, say that it's going to be the, I mean it's a, a great promise we we were promised uh, all for 70 years, we've been living with this promise that there was going to be a oh yeah the waste we can there will, we will be able to dispose of that uh, easily and it turned out to be not true. I don't I don't think this fourth generation technology that you're uh, that you want to go all in on is ready yet, is it? Yeah, in fact, uh, that that was what uh, Argonne National Laboratory, our leading uh, laboratory, is Argonne West in Idaho. Uh, 
uh, and they were ready to make a commercial scale uh, reactor in 1992 when uh, when Bill Clinton uh, said let's not do this uh, but they had test reactors which ran safely for decades uh, so it's uh, it's a proven technology and in fact we have a, a company it's uh, it's uh, the prism reactor uh, which uh, uh, I, I can't remember if it's General Electric or Westinghouse, which is uh, has developed this and is uh, probably going to sell it to Great Britain. They look like they're going to be the first customer, but uh, it's it's been uh, not. You know, the problem has been <laughs> that the government has discouraged the demonstration of that technology. And uh, it's because there are a, a, a number of people who are just adamantly uh, anti-nuclear. And uh, the, it, what we need to do is compare. You know, if you want energy, you've got to deal with the costs of that energy and the products of that energy. Here, here's and we've got to compare them in a rational way and then make decisions. Um, and I can tell you that uh, China and India are not willing to say we're going to stay poor. They want to have energy. They want to have their people uh, raised up to a higher standard of living, and that requires energy. Now, you can get it from coal, or you can get it other ways. Uh, but uh, but they're not going to say, oh, we don't. We're not going to do it because uh, it causes a global climate problem. You know, so we've got to be objective about this and compare the pros and cons and do it in a in an objective way. So here's my question. It has to do with comparing. Uh, in all fairness, Dr. Hansen, don't you think that? Uh, you should not just be demanding a carbon ta a carbon fee or a, uh, a fee and dividend system for uh, fossil fuels, but we need to also have such a tax or fee for a nuclear, for hydro, for solar panels, no matter what, and compare. And be very careful in our comparison that we take into consideration the not just the use and the uh, effects to humans, but the effects to the environment and the other, other critters that we share the uh, environment with, but we take into consideration the costs to, uh, the, all, the overall costs in getting the energy uh, out of the ground and fabricated into, uh, and also the dismantling of the, uh, the de decommissioning of whatever facilities you are, the de decommissioning of yeah, the, absolutely. And, and to consider the long term uh, effects down the line. I think if you if you were willing to talk about such a fee, not just for uh, for fossil fuels, but also for nucle nuclear, taking in consideration the long term uh, effects to humanity, maybe your enthusiasm would be diminished. And I just think it's dishonest not to not to not to compare everything in in the yeah. same way. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That's the, that's exactly what I want, and that's exactly what has not been occurring. As I mentioned, uh, a good example is the fact that the uh, fossil fuels are killing 10,000 people per day. You really have to compare this and be objective about, instead of just accepting uh, scare stories, you really need to look at it in a quantitative, objective way. Now, let's talk about the cost. You mentioned that, well, the cost of decommissioning and the cost of dealing with the waste. In fact, the nuclear power plants have had to pay a tax that's been collected by the government, a tenth of a cent on each kilowatt hour. So, uh, uh, it sounds like a small amount. Well, it's now over $30 billion. And uh, that... Uh, they've wasted 10 out of the 30 billion uh, monkeying around in uh, on the uh, trying to build uh, a repository in the West for the nuclear waste. But in fact, they've collected all this money, more than enough to handle the nuclear waste. Uh, so it is, in fact, already included. And it's included in the electricity bill. 
for uh, electricity that's generated from nuclear power plants. So th those things need to be done, and they need to be done objectively and compare uh, carefully the costs of and the, the total costs, including the health costs and and uh, the economic costs. Um. <clears throat> I, I'm. I was really interested in your statistic. Eighty. I think it was eighty-five percent uh, uh, fossil fuel and fifteen percent uh, nuclear-generated power. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm. Uh, I've got a question about nuclear power. I'm, I'm Swedish, so I don't think I'm overrun by emotion. Uh, but. Uh, um, well, first of all, first of all, uh, uh, Keith Ellison and Bernie Sanders just sponsored a bill uh, called the End Polluter Welfare Act, which is primarily fossil fuel. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to ask you uh, just how that relates to the carbon fee that you're talking about. But the nuclear, uh, I, I was uh, reading my property insurance about a year ago, and it said. Uh, uh, we're not covered uh, for a disaster at a nuclear power plant. And I started looking into that, and finally, my legend, well, I found that virtually no property insurance covers us because of that uh, stated risk. And uh, finally talked to my state legislator who said, yes, the government is the insurer for that. Uh, and in my mind, that's an enormous subsidy from the beginning for uh, nuclear power, kind of secret to us, because I found that virtually nobody knows what I just said. Um, and so I, I'm, what I'm curious about is, what if, uh, I think the end polluter welfare subsidy is saying, you know, put it more into uh, clean energy, which you talked briefly about. What, what if we very uh, heavily went into all of these subsidies, uh, nuclear and fossil fuel, going to uh, uh, wind energy, solar energy, you know, and wind with the, you know, it's bad because birds get killed without telling us that uh, more birds get killed by flying into windows. So that's my quest questions. Yeah, that's, you see, you see, that's what we need to do. We need to be objective and compare the costs. You know, you're, you're, you've spent an enormous amount of your money uh, subsidizing the disasters caused by fossil fuels. Uh, what disasters has your tax money been used to cover for nuclear accidents? Uh, little, if any. So you have to be objective and compare what, in, in a quantitative way. Uh, you know, it, nuclear power has not killed anybody in the United States uh, in, in, uh, from uh, nuclear accidents, other than the possible one or two people in Pennsylvania from that accident in a statistical sense. How, how much better can you demand it to be? Uh, while at the same time, we're killing tens of thousands of people a year in the United States and millions in the world from fossil fuel use. So we just have to be, uh, you, <laughs> you see why I normally don't bring this subject up, because you get this tremendous uh, emotional response from uh, the audiences, uh, which uh, it's, there's not a whole lot of rational basis for it, but we, I, I understand where it came from. There's a very good book called The Rise of Nuclear Fear, and I recommend it to you. Uh, it explains how the confusion has occurred between nuclear weapons and nuclear power, uh, and it, uh, it well, as I say, it's worth reading. Uh, and uh, as I say also, I, I usually don't even bring this up simply for that reason, but uh, because people are just emotional about it rather than uh, willing to look at it quantitatively and compare the dangers and compare the costs. Uh, but uh, I think we really need to do that. 